is our latest base weather forecast. We're expecting a solar storm to hit Earth this Sunday. This is the coronal hole that we see. The solar wind flowing from this southern coronal hole should reach Earth March 31st, 30th, 31st, according to the uh, NASA and space weather. This is a picture of the sun, 28th of March, today that is. So solar wind is incoming. 403.2 kilometers per second right now. Density 7.4 protons per cubic centimeter. A minor stream of solar wind is approaching our Earth. Estimated time arrival March 30th to 31st. Flowing from a southern hole in the sun's atmosphere. And the incoming stream could spark springtime auroras around the Arctic Circle. Also sunset skies show tonight when the sun goes down. Step outside and look west. There's a heavenly triangle in the sunset sky. The vertices are Venus, the crescent moon, and the Pleiades. Venus and the moon pop out of the twilight first, followed by seven sisters as the sky fades to black. So solar storm expected to hit Earth Sunday, or our forecasters, to look for northern lights. The small hole opening on the surface of the sun into the south hemisphere will allow the stream of solar particles entering into the cosmos and the cosmic forecaster said Earth is in the crosshairs of this solar wind, of course. The particles now making their way across the uh, 92 million mile or 150 million kilometer journey from the sun to our Earth, expected to arrive on Sunday. The space weather said the minor stream of solar wind expected to hit Earth's magnetic field March 29, starting tomorrow, possibly sparking auroras in the Arctic Circle. And this material is flowing from the southern hole of the sun's atmosphere. Auroras include northern lights, aurora borealis, and also the southern lights, aurora australis. They're caused when the solar particles hit our atmosphere. And as the magnetosphere gets bombarded by solar winds, stunning blue lights can appear as that layer of atmosphere deflects the particles. Now, I was lucky enough to watch, to be able to observe Aurora Borealis, the Northern Lights, when I was living in Montreal, Canada. I was about 12 years old. We were coming back one Friday evening. How did I know it was Friday? This Friday evening was when my mother was playing cards late at night. It was very late at night. We would sleep in the living room of whoever friend's house she was at. All the girls used to get together, the ladies, that is. And they would have dinner, and they would play cards. And we would watch fantastic television. <laughs> I, it was about Christmas season, so we watched all these beautiful Bob Hope and Crosby, you know, white Christmas movies. And uh, then we went home, and as we were coming out of the car, you know, half asleep, I looked at the sky, and this was this magnificent, shivering rainbow of of Aurora Borealis, the Northern Lights, and they looked so low. They were uh, soundless. Soundless. To see this thing soundless above you, shivering, it was something really mystical. I'll never forget that. It's not just blue lights, it's every light in the rainbow, actually. That's what I witnessed. So this is going to be beautiful if you're there to see it. Now, researchers also said the consequences of the solar storm and space weather can extend beyond northern lights or southern lights, and for the most part, the Earth's magnetic field protects us from the barrage of radiation, which comes from the sunspots, but solar storms can affect satellite-based technology. Solar winds can heat the Earth's atmosphere, causing it to expand, and this can affect satellites in our orbit, potentially leading to lack of GPS or some kind of skewed GPS signals, mobile phone signals, and the satellite TV and such. So, uh, also, surges of particles can lead to high currents in the magnetosphere, which can lead to higher than normal electricity. So, it can have, we can have surges of electricity resulting in electrical transmitters and power station blowouts and loss of power because of that. Now, we do have rare events where uh, these storms are quite strong, as we had in the um, 1859 Carrington event. 
that was so strong that telephone systems went down across Europe. There's also reports that some buildings were set on fire as a result of that electrical surge. A recent study found that these solar storms should happen about every 25 years on average, meaning that we are perhaps overdue. Researchers from University of Warwick, this is on Express UK, and British Antarctic Survey analyzed the last 14 solar cycles dating back 150 years. The analysis showed that severe magnetic storms occur in 42 out of the past the last 150 years. Severe. And great superstorms occurred six years out of 150 years. So a researcher said if it had hit Earth, it could have down technology on our planet. The lead author, Professor Chapman of University of Warwick Center for Fusion Space and Astrophysics said, these superstorms are rare events, but estimating their chance of occurrence is an important part of planning the level of mitigation needed to protect critical national infrastructure. There is, this research proposed a new method to approach historical data to provide a better picture of the chance of occurrence of superstorms and what superstorm activity we're likely to see in the future. Now, how can we protect ourselves from such superstorms? That's the question we have to answer. Are we ready in the case such a character event happens again? Or will we be um, have lacking our... Uh, uh, energy systems, or electrical energy systems. This is by Sean Martin and also Space Weather, and I'll leave links below for you. Now, Space Weather also has a listing of the near-Earth asteroids, the potentially hazardous asteroids, the space rocks larger than about 300 feet across, 100 meters, that can come closer to our Earth than 0 0.05 AU. None of the known PHAs it's on a collision course with our planet, although astronomers are finding new ones all the time. On March 28th today, there were 2018 potentially hazardous asteroids. The next ones coming up are uh, asteroid FE2 2020. That's coming up today. 4.5 lunar distances, velocity of 7.1 kilometers per second, diameter of about 70 feet across. And then on March 29 tomorrow, FK4220, that's just about the same size, 4.4 lunar distances across, uh, from west, and that's at uh, velocity a little slower at 5.3 seconds, kilometers per second. Diameter is 11 meters, it's about 35, 40 feet across. And also, we have to keep in mind that the uh, flights, of course, nobody's flying now, I would venture to say, but the higher you go, the more hours you spend, the more radiation you get from uh, dosage of uh, cosmic rays in the atmosphere. Also, we know that uh, we have stratospheric radiation that has really uh, increased since March 2015 to 2018, increase of 18%, and this could be because of the fact that uh, we are entering into a solar minimum and also the fact that for some reason unknown our, the Earth's magnetic field is diminishing and cosmic rays are passing through and when cosmic rays crash into Earth's atmosphere they produce a spray of secondary particles that is most intense at the entrance to the stratosphere the radiation centers aboard helium balloons detect the X-rays and gamma rays in the energy range, and these energies span the range of medical X-ray machines and airport security scanners. So why are, we, why are cosmic rays intensifying? The main reason is the sun, solar storm clouds such as coronal mass ejection CMEs, sweep aside the cosmic rays when they pass by Earth. And during solar maximum, CMEs are abundant and cosmic rays are held at bay. But now that we're in the solar minimum, the solar cycle swinging towards solar minimum, allowing cosmic rays to return. Another reason could be the weakening of Earth's magnetic field, which helps protect us from deep space radiation, according to space weather.
If you'd like to join me on my Patreon account, you will hear content not covered by mainstream media. These riveting stories will be based on my research and I will state my opinions and give my personal insight on diverse and controversial subjects and world events, events not covered by mainstream media, and not certainly on not supported by YouTube guidelines. So whatever I have on my Patreon, most of those will not be on my YouTube channel. Please consider becoming a member today. More of the, the most significant and important videos will be on my Patreon channel. Your support helps me to continue my research and keeps this YouTube channel alive. And we depend on your support, your generous charity, because we help economically challenged families here in Athens, Greece, in Kapota, and we also help the young generation with university tuition and the community around our church. Thank you.